So in talking about KA band systems, uh, and specifically KA satellites that are designed for data, it, it's not just good enough to talk about the frequency band, the KA band. We, we have to talk about the satellite design. If you look at satellites that have been designed over the last 50 years, most of the satellites are designed for broadcast. And as you can see, a satellite that's designed for broadcast, it has very wide beams. So it's well suited for TV. You want to reach as many people as possible across a very wide geographic area. But for data, in fact, we're, when, the, when the satellite carries data traffic, Generally, that, that data traffic is going to only one user terminal. So we don't, we don't have the design objective of distributing as widely as possible. This allows us to apply frequency reuse. And so the, the satellites that are optimized for data have lots and lots of user beams. And this allows us to reuse the frequency spectrum that's allocated for that satellite and that orbital slot. And this is going to give us um, the ability to also have more bits per hertz because these beams are smaller and we're able to get more EIRP on, on, on the downlink and more G on T or, or gain on the receive link. And what this is going to translate into is more bits uh, per hertz and more bits on the satellite. So the, the frequency reuse that we apply with KA band systems is, is really a key enabler to get high capacity. Uh, consider uh, a multi-beam system of uh, 50 beams or so. We're going to use a combination of frequency separation uh, as well as polarization separation so that adjacent beams don't interfere with each other or interfere minimally. But if, if each one of these beams in a 50 beam system is 500 megahertz, that's going to be 25,000 megahertz or 20, 25 gigahertz of capacity uh, in terms of the frequency that we have available for use by the user terminals. And if we are getting something like 2 bits per hertz, which is reasonable given that uh, these are fairly small beams, and if we can get a lot of power, a lot of ERP, a lot of G on T in these beams, um, this is going to translate to about 50 gigabits uh, for this sample 50 beam, uh, uh, 50 beam uh, satellite with 500 megahertz per beam. And that's, that's 50 gigabits only on the forward channel. The return channel is probably going to be about the same, maybe a little bit less. Uh, so you've got about 100 gigabits uh, with a satellite. And that's significantly more capacity than uh, we see with a conventional satellite that's optimized for, for broadcast TV. Conventional satellites are, are really designed for broadcast. And, and as you can see, what, what that means is that um, the transmission from the satellite really in, in the conventional satellite uh, terminology, we talk about transponders. A conventional transponder is going to cover a large geographic area. Here's an example of a transponder that, that's really focused on Brazil. In the US, they, they call them CONUS satellites, uh, continental US coverage. These are, so these are transponders that cover a wide geographic area. If we were to run data over the these kinds of satellites, we're going to get a lot less capacity. An example is consider a satellite that has 40 transponders, and these transponders are 36 megahertz per transponder. Let's be aggressive and assume that you can get 2 bits per hertz, which because these are transponders that are covering such wide geographic areas, we're going to have um, a dissipation of the EIRP and GNT, which means we're probably not going to reach 2 bits per hertz. But let's say 2 bits because that's convenient for math purposes. If you do the math, 40 transponders times 36 megahertz per transponder times the 2 bits per hertz, we're going to get the equivalent of about 2.8 gigabits of capacity. That's a lot less than the example I just went through for, for KA band. And by the way, 
Uh, the example I use for KA band, there's a number of satellites that have significantly more capacity than that. For instance, the Viasat-1, uh, the Hughes-Jupiter, uh, Eutelsat KA sat they all have much more capacity than the example I went through. So you can see where by having a satellite that is designed and optimized for data, we can do much more capacity than a satellite that's really designed and optimized for TV. Let's look at what the components that go into a KA band high capacity satellite system. In fact, these components are really the same set of components that you would find in any regular VSAT system that runs in C band or, or KU band. You've got the satellite, gotta have that. You've got uh, gateway stations, user terminals, and then you have the air interface. Now, uh, the different thing with KA band is that um, we really have a concept of beams. Uh, and we have user beams where the user terminals are located. And then we have gateway beams where the gateway stations are located. And the connectivity is that from a gateway station, which is the ingress, egress access into the internet, from a gateway station, we go via a gateway feeder beam into the satellite. And then we drop or map into four, five, six user beams where we achieve connectivity to the user terminals. So in these KA systems, what's different from KUNC is this architecture of a gateway and a gateway beam mapping into multiple user beams. And what this means is that, among other things, were unable to provide single hop connectivity within the user beam because all the transmission gets mapped from a user beam over the satellite into the gateway and vice versa. It's optimized for really internet access or access from a central point, the gateway station, to the user terminals. When an operator uh, decides they're gonna do KA band for, for data, uh, the operator has to make a number of decisions about the design of the KA band system. There's a laundry list of things that have to be considered, uh, not least of which is the fact that that satellite's gonna last for 15 years, and to get the most capacity, those beams are gonna be fixed. So the beam pattern, and thus the location of those beams, and thus the amount of capacity and where it's distributed, that's going to be fixed for 15 years. So the operator has to have a pretty good idea of what the market's going to look like over the next 15 years, the life of the satellite. That's going to mean that there needs to be some trade-offs between um, high population areas uh, and, and the coverage that the operator is going to be providing. Maybe, as in this example of South America, maybe in the middle of the Amazon, you're not going to put any KA band beams. And maybe you just focus the beams in the high population areas because that's where the demand is going to be. We also have to consider how big are the beams going to be? How are we going to shape the beams? And, and how many beams do we want to have? The bigger the beam, we have trade-off. We can cover a bigger geographic area. We can cover more population, but that's going to be at the sacrifice of, of power. There's going to be generally less EIRP and less G on T, so that means that there could be less capacity on that beam, even though we're covering a bigger geographical area. Um, the number of beams is going to impact uh, the satellite design, and it's going to impact uh, things like launch costs. Uh, it may make more sense to have a partial payload. Maybe it's a satellite operator who wants to have some KU band capacity and some KA capacity. Another issue is interference, because you can see these beams, many of the beams can be directly adjacent to one, uh, one another. And we're gonna offset them in frequency and polarization, but we still have an interference factor 
that we have to take into account in our, our link budgets. We also have to think about where are we going to put the gateways. We have to decide, as I said, where we put the user beams, and that's where user terminals go. But then there's the gateway beams, where we're going to put the gateway stations. If we're using the same frequency spectrum for both user beams and gateway beams, that means we want to put the gateway stations where there are no user beams. We also want to put the gateway stations where we have very ready access and cost-effective access to lots of fiber because that's going to be our, our ingress into the internet or into the terrestrial network. We also want to put our gateway stations in places of low rain because we're concentrating a lot of our traffic in the gateway station. If it rains at one user terminal, that's okay. We can mitigate it, but even if it goes out, that's okay. It's just one user terminal. If we lose a gateway station because of rain, that's a big deal. So we want to minimize the impact of, of rain fade on, on gateway stations. So we want to locate them in, in dry areas where possible. And then finally, we need to take into account the asymmetry of internet access. And by that, what I mean is most internet users consume far more capacity from the internet than they do in terms of contributing to the internet. So when people go to YouTube and they go to the file sharing sites, they're consuming generally eight or 10 times more capacity on the downlink than they are in terms of transmitting data back to the internet. So our, our satellite payload should reflect those, those characteristics. So these are just some of the factors that an operator needs to take into account when designing a, a KA band system. KA band is, is the cost impact. If you look at satellite capacity, and you consider that a, a many of the classic broadcast TV satellites, uh, you know, maybe they're one gigabit, two gigabit, generally in that range um, versus a satellite that's custom designed for data in the 100 gigabit range, you can see that's a significant increase in capacity. But the fact is the cost to do a satellite, whether it's broadcast or, or a KA band high capacity satellite, the cost is about the same. So if you consider that the cost is the same, yet you've got much more capacity, what you then come to is that the cost per bit or cost per megabit is significantly lower with a KA band satellite that's optimized for data. This means we can offer more capacity and get more subscribers on the satellite. So with, with our uh, significantly better cost basis on a per bit or per megabit basis with KA band high capacity systems, uh, we, we can change the equation of where satellite fits within the scheme of things like DSL or uh, 3G and 4G. If, if we look at a chart where we show on one axis the cost uh, per household served uh, versus population density, we can see that with terrestrial wireless and terrestrial services, pretty much as we're in very urban areas, we have a low cost uh, per household served. And as we go into the more rural areas where the population density is lower, the, the cost for providing these services increases. And with conventional satellite systems, KU band with broadcast transponders, the point at which KU band can compete is going to be, you know, it's going to be out here where uh, the population density is, is fairly rural uh, and the cost to serve the household is low. But when we bring in the lower cost high throughput KA band systems, this line drops significantly lower 
and we're able to use satellite to provide services in not just rural, but also exurban areas and potentially even suburban areas. There are plenty of places where DSL is only able to provide 800 kilobits or a one megabit. Satellite can effectively compete against this with the KA band high throughput systems where these systems are being designed to deliver five megabits, 10 megabits, 15 megabits of, of capacity. Uh, so this really changes the equation and brings into play satellite as a solution to um, a, a wider range of uh, areas and households. So just in conclusion, some observations of, about um, broadband and, and, and satellite. Um, satellite with this better cost basis, with these more effective systems, KA band high throughput systems, can uh, expand its market to not just rural, but to the underserved markets. You know, again, being able to compete actually against DSL and 3G and uh, potentially 4G. Many of the US subscribers in North America of, of satellite, and, and today, uh, in 2012, there's about a million subscribers who are using satellite-based internet. Um, many of these subscribers are in um, not just rural areas, but exurban areas, in the areas around the cities. Um, so this means that satellite is not just for rural. The cost of a, a satellite connection on a per household basis is in the $300 to $400 range. And when you look at the cost of a terrestrial connection to run fiber or to run some kind of wire or a good quality 4G, in urban areas, it's gonna be more cost effective than satellite. It's gonna be in the area of $100, but the terrestrial guys have to invest a lot of money in infrastructure to get to these exurban areas and rural areas and very quickly, terrestrial-based connections can climb towards $1,000. And so the point is that with the development of KA band high throughput systems, the industry, the satellite industry, is able to bring to the market very cost-effective delivery of broadband that is now able to address markets that really couldn't have been addressed with the prior generation of satellites.